So that brings us to the question of why fuel cells. So even if you did electrolysis, imagine you did electrolysis by some traditional method, you made a bunch of hydrogen, you could in principle take that hydrogen and then just make electricity by traditional means. There's nothing to prevent you from burning the hydrogen to produce electricity. There's a famous photograph of Arnold Schwarzenegger in California with his Hummer. He has a hydrogen powered Hummer. And I think many people for years thought that, oh, well, he's using fuel cells. And actually, no, it's not. It is an internal combustion engine that runs on hydrogen. So, so why couldn't we just do that? We store the energy as hydrogen and then, and then send it to coal-fired power plants and we retrofit them to burn hydrogen gas. Why wouldn't you want to do this? Why would you want to use fuel cells instead? To address that, I think it's worth thinking a little bit about what, um, how we take fuels. If we have a fuel and we convert it into electricity, how does that work exactly? And what are some of the problems or challenges with that? And most of you, I think, from 325 or just from other things you've studied, you're familiar with the ranking cycle, which basically is a, is a process for, for making electricity from fuel that's based on burning. So the idea is we take a fuel, like in this example, we have methane, we burn that with air, produce a gas that's really hot. We use the gas to boil water. We run that through a turbine engine, generate electrical work recycle the water, water goes around in a loop. And what are sort of the good and bad points about kind of trying to do it that way? So one of the issues is efficiency. If you've analyzed the ranking cycle, it turns out it's only about 20 or 30% efficient. The other thing is if you're going to make electricity with fuels, just in general, that usually requires at least sort of a minimum scale. So you've got to site an appropriate place. You've got to buy all the fairly large scale process equipment. You're not gonna do this on like a one kilowatt scale. You're gonna be talking about tens or hundreds of megawatts at least or bigger. So it requires a large scale, it requires a lot of planning, usually a long lead time because you've got to get approval processes with you know the state government or whatever. The other thing is it's a single place, like it is one plant, it produces the electricity, it introduces single points of failure. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in a bit, but anything goes wrong in the process, it, the process has to shut down. The grid helps level that to some degree. Sometimes, you know, plant goes down, there's lots of other places you can get electricity, but um, if as things get bigger, they become more efficient, they also become larger single points of failure. So there, there's this trade-off between redundancy and, and efficiency usually with large scale power generation that is just sort of part of the equation. So, so to help thinking about this efficiency issue a little bit more, one thing you can do is go through a process cycle like this ranking cycle and try to figure out where where is the work lost? Because if it's only 20 to 30% efficient, you know, where is the other two thirds or three quarters of the electricity going? Um, and just as an example, if you take a ranking cycle operating between, you, you know, at 500 C to 100 C temperature range, which is pretty typical, um, the maximum work you would get out would be 820 kilojoules per mole, just based on the heating value of the fuel. Uh, you can also think about this as an exergy analysis, sort of like we did back in Chemi 325. Um, the maximum work, if you did everything reversibly, now call that 100% efficiency, you would expect about 820 kilojoules per mole. What you actually get is more like 260 cool kilojoules per mole. So, and that's, that's in sort of the best case scenario. That's sort of like the idealized process. The real process is actually even less efficient than that. So that means about 68%-ish of your reversible work is being lost someplace. And what you can do is go through and do an exergy analysis and analyze which piece of equipment in your process. And if we just think about this as a simple four, five component process with a combustor, turbine engine, condenser, and a boiler, and a pump, and you go through and you do the exergy 
analysis of this process to see where the lost work is happening, you can do that. And um, here's what the numbers look like. So uh, the number one source of exergy loss, which, you know, where's the entropy being generated basically? It is the combustor. So in this case, 330 kilojoules per mole out of our 820 is being immediately instantaneously lost just by the fact that we have combustion. We're taking molecules that are way out of equilibrium and we're letting them react in an uncontrolled way to produce a bunch of thermal energy. And that inherently is very irreversible. So we get this huge exergy loss, about a third or more of the, of the theoretical available power is lost immediately upon combustion. Um, the other bigger, you know, actors of the, is, is heat exchange. So the boilers, the condensers, any kind of Delta T that you have in your heat exchange equipment, that is gonna incur fairly large exergy losses as well. So roughly, you know, maybe another 30% is lost due to the heat exchange processes. So roughly speaking, a third is lost in combustion, a third is lost in heat exchange, and then you have, you know, some other ancillary things. Efficiency of the turbine engine, efficiency of the pump, the rotating equipment, those kinds of things, not an issue, like for the most part. So it's not like I, we can engineer a more efficient turbine engine or engineer a more efficient, you know, pump or something. That's not really going to help us very much. It's, it's, it's the delta T's that we have and it's the combustion. So that brings us to the fuel cell. So we think about combustion just as a general thing. If I take a fuel and I take oxygen and I burn them and I make heat out of them, even if this is all isothermal, um, about a third of the reversible work potential of that fuel is lost. A fuel cell, you're, you're, you're still combusting. You're taking a, a fuel and oxygen, you're burning them to produce CO2 and water, but you're producing two things from that. You're producing heat as you normally would, but you're also producing at the same time electricity. And if you just do an energy balance around that, you know the heat and the electricity that you're producing together have to add up to the enthalpy differences. So again, if I, if I take the same inputs and outputs, fuel in, exhaust out, we do the calculation of how much heat we could generate versus how much heat and electricity we would generate. The fuel cell lets us produce some of that energy as electricity directly and rather than as heat. And, and so a significant fraction of that, you know, irreversible combustion loss, we're gonna get some of that back by using a fuel cell. So that's one major advantage of a fuel cell. It gets at this fundamental problem of irreversible combustion. However, I will also point out that a lot of folks are now focusing on fuel cells for other reasons too. And to illustrate that, we can go to this, this example that I've been sort of been talking about, which is you know, the data center application. And we think about what is it, what are all the nece necessary steps from going from a fuel like our natural gas to making, you know, to running computers. And it's actually kind of complicated. So we have the generation step, we, we have a you know, ranking cycle or coal-fired power plant or ethane-fired power plant. We make electricity. That electricity has to be distributed over a grid network. That then goes to a substation outside the data center. The substation down converts the high voltage, low current electricity that's being transmitted along the power lines and into a form that can be used within the data center, hundreds of volts instead of 40,000 volts. And then that is further, uh, converted, we have, we have uh, transformation processes to lower the voltage further, switching equipment, which redistributes that electricity. Uh, and then finally, uh, we have to rectify it. We have to take that AC power and convert it into DC electricity. Direct, so alternating current versus direct current. Direct current is just the type of, like when you have five volt USB, that's direct current. You're not you don't have oscillations, but when you plug into the wall at 120 volts, that's an AC alternating current. Computers run on direct current, not on alternating current. So every ultimately we have to convert everything to DC current in the, in the rack basically to run hard drives and computers. Um, that is another step that has to take place. 
and and then any point any of these things can fail at any moment and so you know your data is important data centers in general have a huge backup network first you know line of defense is lead acid battery so like how you know you probably have maybe you have a ups connected to your computer so for when the power goes down data centers do that like to the nth degree so they've got these giant banks of lead acid batteries sitting there waiting doing nothing until the power goes out for a second and then they kick in and produce the necessary uh, electricity uh, and that only lasts for a minute or two and that minute or two it, it, during which the diesel backup generators get going. So they've got this banks and banks of diesel backup generators outside that take a minute or two to turn on and start producing electricity. Not particularly re reliable, uh, certainly not <laughs> very uh, environmentally friendly because they're, you know, diesel spewing out lots of particulates when they first turn on. So there's this problem of, of backup power that is hugely expensive and also uh, of limited reliability, that is sort of an inherently difficult situation to manage because when you have lots of points of failure, you need lots of backup systems and they have points of failure. And, and so you, you can go through and calculate reliability and it's not that great. I mean, to get to five nines reliability in a data center is a very, very expensive thing. And so that's why uh, people are one. That's another reason people are interested in fuel cells is because of the simplicity. So imagine taking that whole electrical infrastructure that we're currently kind of beholden to, and replacing it with distributed power. And the idea is, you know, you send in the same fuel, but it's stored in a tank. You've got nine days of storage if you need it for however long the outage is going to be. And then you feed it to fuel cells and the fuel cells are right in the data center. You take the electricity that you're making and you feed it directly into the rack that it's sitting on top of. Um, and there's no AC rectification because there's no AC power. We're taking fuel, we're making DC electricity, we're feeding it directly into the computers and then the exhaust products come out of the data center. So the energy production, energy storage, all that's being done at the data center, not by our grid network around the data center. And, and so the philosophy is, you know, you have much simpler system, it has inherent redundancy because every single rack has its own fuel cell. And all of a sudden this thing starts to become very, very reliable because of this massive redundancy effect. So it fits in very nicely with the philosophy of a data center. You have this massive redundancy of data. You have also a massive redundancy of power. Uh, and so you lower the cost, you lower the risk by, by, by distributing the power. There's also some other ideas that people have out there, which is, you know, for example, cogeneration. If you're making electricity right in the data center and you're also making heat, you could use that heat maybe to generate cooling. You can use a, what's called a, an absorption uh, chiller to generate the necessary cooling to cool the computers off or to provide supplemental cooling during periods of high temperature. Another advantage is incremental expansion. If you're doing distributed power, you can get efficiency at very small scale. You don't build a power plant all at once for your data center, or which takes 10 years to do. Instead, you're, it's, it's under your control. You build a data center, every rack goes in, you put in a fuel cell and you add more racks, you add more fuel cells. And so your, your energy capacity can scale incrementally with your data capacity in a way that you absolutely have no control over if you're buying the electricity from, an, from a utility. Um, and so there's a lot of appeal to that too. Uh, here's just an example in South Seattle, there is a pilot plant being run. This is a project that was uh, sponsored by Microsoft and Cummins. They got together and built this facility. It's, it's a small pilot demonstration unit basically where they try, they're piloting this concept. And the idea is you have a row of racks, computer racks, and then each rack has its own fuel cell. And then these fuel cells de 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 deliver the electricity directly to the rack. And then if one of them fails, you can share the electricity among them. And they've been testing the reliability of this um, on, mostly on artificial data loads. So just trying to see how well the fuel cells handle the up and down demand of the electricity in a, in a data center application. That's a little bit about fuel cells and I think why 
like, you know, why in the last five years has there been such a resurgence of interest in them again? Uh, I think a lot of it has to do with the sort of secondary arguments about fuel cells and distributed power. 